Welcome back to the Game Link Podcast, everyone. I'm your host, Lebby, and I'm joined by my friend Elmer, as always. Well, howdy ho, neighborinos. <laughs> um, this week, we're going to be talking about the Prince of Persia from, what, 2010? 2010, the year we graduated from high school. <laughs> Can you believe it? That was 12 years ago. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, just about, actually. Um but yeah, before we get into that, uh, what have you been up to this last week, Elmer? Uh, pretty much this last week, just kind of getting back in the swing of things at work, um, getting over my multiple hangovers from um, St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> and uh, oh, there's something else that happened this past week, and I can't put my finger on what it was. Uh, Do you see any good movies? or? No, that wasn't it. Hmm. The dogs for a walk? No, that wasn't it. Stepping anything good? No, that wasn't it. Buy anything great? Nah. Oh! Five minutes before we started this, I bought a one pound bag of Chapulins, aka <laughs> fried grasshoppers, straight from Mexico. Oh. So those are going to be delivered at my house, uh, hopefully by Tuesday. And uh, this gentleman here got to see my eating habits earlier in the day. And oh, the look and the look on his face and the shade of green I turned him was just priceless. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's uh, that's cool. So, you still buy those even though you don't have like a like a scorpion to feed them to anymore? Oh yeah, no, it ain't going. It ain't <laughs> going to the critter. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, let's see. What did I do? I I was planning on working on a Sega Game Gear and a Game Boy that uh, Elmer supplied me to fix for someone uh, he knows. But uh, stuff got crazy at work, so I'm gonna be planning on doing that this week instead. Um, otherwise, yeah, I've been playing, I've been playing a lot of Skyward Sword and trying to finish that game. Uh, it's a lot better than I originally gave it credit for, so, um, it's a good one. Uh, and then, what else? Oh, yes, I, I put a one terabyte hard drive in my PlayStation 2, and I loaded it up with games. Um, so I've been playing a, a little bit of PS2 lately, too, like some, some bully and, uh, uh, motocross versus ATV, like Unleashed or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, good games. I just did the math in my head about how, how much is uh, one terabyte of PS2 games. Um, let's see. I I didn't download all the PS2 games. I downloaded maybe like 150 or so, maybe less of the ones that I really liked, and it was about 600 gigs. Really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, the games are usually between like one to four gigs, unless they're simple, you know. So even back on PS2 era, that's uh, okay. Yep. Oh yeah, you learn something new every day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, here I thought you were gonna say that. Yeah, I've got all of PS1 and PS2 on my one terabyte hard drive. <laughs> no, I wish, but uh, yeah. Either way, it's been really cool um, playing old systems like that and stuff. So. Um, yeah, so Prince of Persia, uh, have you, have you played any of the Prince of Persia games? <laughs> Funny you bring this up. I have played all of two of the Prince of Persia games. Uh, my cousins, back in the day, they had the original version of Prince of Persia, where it was based off of, well, basically a guy with a motion, early form of motion capture, <laughs> filming and basically rotoscoping his brother running around in a gi. Uh, yeah, I played that with my cousins, and then later... On the Apple II? Something like that. Yeah. Uh, and then back... Oh, boy. Sometime in middle school, a, friend of, a, a mutual friend of ours had the original Prince of Persia, the Sands of Time game, and oh, that was a lot of fun to watch. Just hmm. seeing all these cool parkour running around, jumping, <laughs> flying off of walls, and then all of a sudden, oh, slipped on a rock, I died. Oh, and rewind. <laughs> And back in here we go, kind of thing. Okay. So no, I do have a little bit of history with it uh, as well. I have a little bit of history with this movie too. As oh, point out soon. oh boy, yeah, I uh, I own a few of the Prince of Persia games. Um, I, I don't know which ones. I've never honestly really been a fan. Um, something about it never really grabbed me. It just kind of seemed boring. But after researching the the first game for the Apple II, I I can kind of see why I would have gotten that impression. Um, but yeah, I think the last time I tried to play it was like maybe 2016 or so. Uh, I got it on like the PS3 or something, 
and I played for like 30 minutes, and I just couldn't do it. But, uh, but uh, it, it started development in 1986 for the Apple II. Um, the guy's name is Jordan Mechner. Uh, he was like the main creator and developer of the game, um, and he pretty much like his whole career like started with this. Well, it didn't start with this game, but this is what made it, like was what like defined his career. Um, it took him three years to make the game, which back in the '80s was a long time to make a game. Uh, but during that time, he had also like moved to California and partnered with Broader Bunch Software. Um, so he would like work out of their offices and and be employed by them, um, and he also had to like he he was like a young a young guy so he had to like get a car and and all this stuff and like get equipment. He was like fresh out of college so um, he had like some really big thoughts for this game, um, which <laughs> which like. Elmer mentioned earlier it was like an early form of rotoscoping where what he actually wanted to do was film people doing like the movements and then somehow find a way to digitize a VHS tape Um, but he couldn't do it so what he ended up doing was just with like a regular 35 millimeter camera taking still frames of every movement getting it developed and then scanning it in and, and basically like 8-bit rotoscope it. Why does that sound more complicated than what it would really take to put somebody in the 1981 really? movie Tron? <laughs> Just, it, it's so overdone, but... Oh, sorry, 1982 film. <laughs> yeah, it's like really overdone, but uh, I mean, back in the 80s, it was pretty, pretty good looking, so... Um, I mean, it still pretty much holds it up, uh, just in terms of the sprite value to it, as well as just the mm-hmm. actual movement of it. You compare that to just about, I mean, hell, you go up a generation to the next Max series, you try to play any of those games, and it's nothing but stuttery crap. I remember playing, you know, Number Munchers and, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, Oregon Trail, and dear God. Well, it was all st- it was all stuttery crap on the Apple II, also. <laughs> um he uh, he actually published a lot of like his notes and like journal entries and stuff from the t- from when he was developing the game, uh, where he like talked about having trouble finding a house and getting a car and his own office equipment and stuff. Um, and he even talked about how everyone in the office was playing this new Russian game called Tetris, <laughs> and how he was kind of pissed off that Broader Bunch Software wouldn't publish it. Uh, which, if they would have, you know, maybe they would have made it. But uh, but he was really lucky that they let him have so much time to finish um, Prince of Persia. Because his original idea was a lot more simple. Uh, and there originally wasn't supposed to be like a lot of things like sword fighting or like enemies really or like anything like that um so originally there was no enemies in the game um well at least at least there wasn't any enemies that like moved like you did there were just like basically like hardwired in enemies that would just like come at you and attack oh, or whatever okay. you know like, I was gonna say, wait so you literally just jump around <laughs> I was going to say, what is it, the platforming version of, like, fucking Firewatch or something like that? Yeah, but there was, like, yeah, originally there was no enemies. They they eventually hardwired some in later, but um, the, it, there was, like, a huge limitation with the Apple II's memory. And um, he had too many movement animations for the main character sprite um, for there to be something else doing that on the screen. And uh, one of his coworkers like kept pestering him about it and like saying like it's missing something like you need an enemy like what if you just used the same sprite but put a different face on it and um, none of it none of the suggestions would work and she's like well what if you can just swap the color and as he was explaining like no that'll never work uh, he kind of realized like he had an idea so what he did is just like bit shifted the pixels over so it kind of just like mirror the what your main character was doing but in like like a a ghostly like like negative of yourself basically and uh so what they did is they they had it so 
at one point in the game, you would jump through a mirror. And when you jumped through the mirror, the shadow version of yourself would jump out and scuttle off into the darkness. And uh, throughout the entire game, it would just kind of follow you and, wh and whatever and be eerie uh, until the end where you, I don't know, did something with an amulet and, like, rejoined or something. But it was a way that could kind of, like, put put someone else in that moved like you, like, as a as a storytelling device. It was, it was pretty interesting. Um, they named him Shadow Man. <laughs> Creative. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, go figure. Um, and another struggle during development was also related to them being, like, really no enemies. Um, the game just felt, like, empty and lifeless. Um, you'd basically be put into, like, a big arena arena with no, like, clear objective or, like, incentive for reward or anything. Um, except for just, like, well, I gotta find my way out. And when you found your way out, there was no, like, fanfare or, or any, you know, item or nothing like that. So, um, a lot of his coworkers would just kind of be like, dude, this game has nothing interesting about it. <laughs> um... So what he did was he would try adding environmental obstacles like gates or like chasms to jump over um, along with other like puzzles and things like that to solve. And even uh, adding, this is where he add the, the simple enemies like skeletons and stuff that you could sword fight. Um, the game was really just all story and no gameplay, <laughs> which you'll kind of... See some evidence of that if you watch this movie. Well, I was going to say, or if you ever played a prom software game. Oh. <laughs> uh, so towards the end of development, within like months of finishing it, he radically changed every level and rethought the pacing and the rhythm and like the balance of action and storytelling and everything and exploration. Um, and he just like redid everything. Um, which was a really good move <laughs> because otherwise, it, uh, like, that's what made the change from it being, like, boring to, like, having rewards and a progression and mm -hmm. stuff that you cared about. Um, and, and what kind of makes sense, if you didn't know who the screenwriter for the movie is, is Jordan Mechner is a huge fan of film. Um, he was worried that developing games might take away from his time doing stuff with movies, um, or that if he worked on movies, it would take away from his time doing development. Um, but actually, the game gave him his breakthrough as a screenwriter, and his first screenplay that got produced was the movie we watch today, uh, Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time, which I can kind of see as being someone's first screenplay. <laughs> you know uh, but of course the game did well and a lot of people liked it um, like I said before it was always kind of a little too boring for me but I really see why that is and I can kind of like respect it a little bit more even though it's not my, my Jimmy Jam so yeah yeah it was kind of a cool one to research and I, I did it kind of kind of quick but it's pretty good. Yeah, no, that was very enlightening, and no, it kind of <laughs> makes sense for a lot of things in that game, which I haven't thought about in almost twenty years. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time since I played that one, for sure. But uh, yeah, for the film of this, um, all I'm gonna say is this: outside of Super Mario Brothers and the Wreck It Ralph series, Walt Disney Corp has not financed any other video game to movie adaptations. So why the fuck did they think this was a good goddamn idea? <laughs> please. Please tell me. I wish I knew. <sighs> anyway, so this is one of the last films that Jerry Bruckheimer's production studio uh, produced while under the ban banner of Walt Disney. I don't know if a lot of people knew this uh, or know this, but so Michael Bay actually got his start working underneath Jerry Bruckheimer, who is this major producer who has done a bunch of different action movies. That's kind of what his label has been. 
uh, more recent films that they that they've done uh, were like the National Treasure films. Oh, really? Uh, like I said, most of Michael Bay's filmography. Mm. Um, they, but he was partnered with Disney for a very long time. It wasn't until basically some remarks and a little bit of insider investing uh, came out was what kind of ousted them from that. But um, that and also the box office failure that was the hamster movie G-Force. Oh, God. Which, I don't know about you, does anybody remember that? Other than the fact that it basically killed out Jerry <laughs> Bruckheimer's career. But um, with uh, Simpson Bruckheimer's, what the name of it was... Apparently they bought the screenplay for this back in like 2004 and they've been shopping around to try to get this made. Um, but like I said, uh, Bruckheimer Simpson, which was his former partner who uh, anybody who has ever known, anytime you hear about the stories of like the grubby, disgusting, coke addicted, just tyrant of a movie producer, that was Don Simpson, who is the original uh -huh. uh, business partner of Jerry Bruckheimer, produced the Rock produced the uh, first Bad Boys film, uh, the last Boy Scout, the amazing Tony Scott uh, action film that's like a, the precursor to everything that was going to come with Michael Bay. It's like a Michael Bay prototype oh, movie that wasn't even directed by Michael Bay, which is amazing. Oh no! But yeah, just all these crazy movies from that era. This guy was exactly what you think of of a drug dealing and doing disgusting pig of a producer who actually dropped dead of a heart attack <laughs> um, while working on the movie The Rock. Oh, gosh. And, uh, yeah, no, they were partnered with Disney for a very long time from a combination of Touchstone, Hollywood Pictures, and um, uh, 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 the other one, shoot. Uh, there's, it's the place, uh, Buena Vista, Buena Vista. Mm. Um, so I'll, if you any if you ever hear about uh, Hollywood Pictures, uh, Buena Vista, or um, what was the other one I said? Uh, Touchstone. Touchstone. Yes, all those are actually Disney subsidiaries. So mm. anytime you hear about how Disney is never financed an R-rated film, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hell, uh, no joke. Disney actually owned the Weinstein Company. Oh gosh. They're the ones who bought those, those pigs out. <laughs> but. Um, no, so yeah, they got the script, they had their hands on the script on this 2004 shopping around for a little bit. Um, after they're actually signed out with Disney in the mid to late 90s, or 2004, not 94. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, they got that, and after they uh, had, had their big success with uh, National Treasure, which was kind of a throwback to uh, like the Indiana Jones style adventure films, uh, they were trying to get this film off the ground. And they thought to themselves, you know what? We want great representation of characters, you know, exhibiting who they are in this film you know we, we want people who are ethnically uh either persian arab or someone from you know like a southwestern asia anyone who's seen this film can automatically tell they fucking failed hard <laughs> harder than anything else i've ever seen oh, no. as i said the levy here halfway through it uh this is almost as bad as john wayne playing genghis khan in the conqueror at least less people got cancer on this film though <laughs> God. But uh, anyway, the guy who directed this um, is a very famous uh, British director, actually. Um, one second, I'll pull some of it. His name back up. My apologies. It's okay. <laughs> Mike Newell. Sorry, I know too hmm. many Newells, and I didn't want to say the wrong Newell right there. Not Gabe Newell. Not Gabe Newell. Not our uh, precious Gabin. But, uh, you know, Gabe Newell, uh, director of Four Weddings of, in a Funeral <laughs> in Johnny said... Brasco. Um, oh, I should say, and Mona Lisa Smile. And uh, the worst Harry Potter film as well, uh, The Goblet of Fire, which if that was any indication, oh, we were in so much trouble for this movie. <laughs> anyway, Four Weddings and a Funeral. I like it. Donnie Brasco, fantastic. You know, Mona Lisa Smile, if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> but why they thought, oh, let's combine parkour... With uh, oh, the God. Brendan Fraser Mummy movie. <laughs> I don't know who thought that was a good idea, but couldn't we all have just went, they already have that, it's called the Scorpion King. Um, <laughs> but they made the movie, uh, you know, the, per the great Persian actor Jane, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, who is a uh, Polish-Russian Jew on his mother's side, and um, uh, Swedish royalty on his father's, plays <laughs> our titular Prince of Persia. 
Um, Cockney uh, Gemma Arterton plays the Persian princess. And uh, who else? Uh, oh, their father, who is played by the amazingly named, I shit you not, the king of their Persian empire. His name, in the actor's name in real life, was Ronald Pickup. <laughs> um, yeah. And I mean, look, uh, through a lot of Sanskrit uh, cultures and stuff like that around this era before the actual rise of um, Islam and, mu and Muslim culture and stuff like that, yes, there was an actual Aryan element to that where they basically looked upon royalty, anyone who was within a whiter complexion, whiter skin tone and stuff like that. However, <laughs> there's a limit, guys. <laughs> it was just like a bunch of like frat bros. <laughs> just, it was... I can't Ooh, make a Bill and Ted jokes the entire time. <laughs> I was expecting them to start talking about Socrates. <laughs> but, uh... I've kind of been leading Levy here on for this evening in terms of this film. Mm -hmm. I have seen this film before. I saw this film not long after it came out back in 2010 when it was released on the video. I was living on Pennsylvania at the time going to school. I saw the movie... Sober, which is, I should clue in right there. <laughs> a mistake? Is, well, one mistake into a rarity, at least in the past 12 years. And um, I just went, well, never watching that movie again. <laughs> uh, later that weekend, I'm doing a Skype, my weekly Skype call that I would do with my parents. I'm talking to them, and my folks went, oh, by the way, we saw this new movie that came out. I said, yeah, what movie was that? And they go, what was it called again, Brad? Uh, <laughs> Prince of Persia, I think? <laughs> and so here's the one funny bit. Um, with my family, they are not a lot like me. Um, in terms of humor-wise and sensibilities, yes. But in terms of like what things we like, not so mm -hmm. much. Uh, I'm a little more free-spirited in that regard. I've got a, more of a like for a, a little bit more, shall we say, genre-ish culture and whatnot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, for the love of God, my parents are big fans of watching American Idol, uh, oh. American Football, <laughs> and, uh, oh, um, Wheel of Fortune. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, so when I hear my, so, you know, I'm thinking to myself, I'm feeling a little bit like an outcast here. I am this gigantic horror fan. I'm living on the other side of the, United States, I'm like, my parents, I'm nothing like my parents, you know, this feels like a drag, I feel like a disconnect between us and stuff like that, and I've been feeling like that for like a month, mm -hmm. and so I'm talking to them, and they go, oh yeah, we just watched Prince of Persia, I'm like, oh, you watched Prince of Persia, what do you think, and my parents look at me and I go, it fucking sucked, <laughs> no, nope, never mind, we're on the same track here, <laughs> and like I said, that might be the most Barry story I could possibly tell you about the Prince of Persia. That's pretty great. That's pretty great. But um, anyway, now production of this movie, uh, Disney is still a little tight-lipped in terms of what the actual budget for it was. Um, they say it's anywhere between 110 and 200 million dollars. And uh, well, anyway, at the worldwide box office, it made about 400 billion dollars, which until Warcraft came out was the highest grossing video game movie of all time. And considering potentially part of those funds was that only doubled its budget, that's not good. <laughs> that's not <laughs> a high bar to set. Um, anyway, that basically killed any chance of this movie getting a sequel. <laughs> good. But simultaneously, I go, you fill this film with so many great British character actors. You mm -hmm. waste them. And on top of that, the titular game... The sense of time that this is ma that based off of the whole point of that game is you're able to rewind time at the drop of a hat, reset yourself in motion, and kick ass all the way. You mm -hmm. use that fucking gimmick th four fucking times in this film. <laughs> Two hour movie, four times. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. I think what I said when we were watching it, it was like the the plot is like almost good like the production value is great um but something about it like it's just too cheesy like too like at times campy even it's just like really weird uh <laughs> I, I don't know 
I may have forgotten to mention the other most infamous films by uh, Jerry Bruckheimer's production company. Um, one of the highest grossing series in film history. And no, not the Transformers, the other one. <laughs> Pirates of the Caribbean were produced oh, by Brian Simpson. That makes sense. Uh, with a sense of high action in terms of kind of a, a lot of inspiration from like Raiders of the Lost Ark and uh, a little bit of Hong Kong cinema too in terms of kind of the acrobatics and stuff like that skipping around. And then kind of merging that with like a sense of like mysticism um, mm-hmm. and a touch of humor to it. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody saw that first Pirates of the Caribbean film. Everybody had fun with that first Pirates of the Caribbean film. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, hey, this is this is fun. I like this. Yeah. And then the other part came out. Yeah, they just kept pumping them out. The second one, I was like, okay. The third one, I was like, oh, all right. I think it was I... because you and I, on our way walking to that film, we saw the funniest thing of the night. Oh, do you remember it? I don't. I don't remember. Oh, you don't remember that? You and I walking. No. We're, we're freshmen in high school. We're walking up oh. the block. And all of a sudden, yeah. some senior rolls down his window <laughs> and starts shouting just the worst obscenities possible at us. Yelling every single homophobic slur you can imagine at two 14 year olds <laughs> walking down the street and just screaming at us, laughing. And then he didn't realize the car in front of him had stopped at the red light and he immediately crashes into him. <laughs> the look of shock on this guy's face was the most palpable I've ever seen. And all Levy and I do is we stop. And we start yelling, which I hate to say, some very, very bad intellectually <laughs> disabled slurs at this gentleman. Yeah. I won't say them, but I will say we call him an idiot in every single sense of the phrasing yeah. and words possible in the same tone of mocking voice. In the entire time he sat there holding a steering wheel, just going... <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was pretty great uh, to see... <laughs> To see karma, actually. You know, oh, like God. That. Just instantaneous karma within five seconds of it happening. <laughs> Look, the third part of the Caribbean movie is not a great film, but just that experience alone colored that movie for me that I still have a lot of fun any time the movie's on and I watch it. So <laughs> maybe that's a bad example. Anyway, uh, sorry for the weird digression there. I just figured I'd throw that story out there because it's pretty damn funny. Um <clears throat> But uh, you can kind of see a lot of inspiration where those films kind of left off in 2007, yeah. where this film picks up in 2010. Definitely. Unfortunately, they don't have a Gore Verbinski directing this. You know, they have the guy who directed Mona Lisa's Smile directing mm. this. Um, they don't have Johnny Depp in this. They have Jake Gyllenhaal. <laughs> Their heart may have been in the right place in terms of we want representation of different cultures. We're going to go strive for uh, for historical accuracy in terms of set direction and just how everything looks to it, as well as a majority of the actors. Well, I'd say about half the actors. <laughs> I'll be generous. Half the actors of this actually are from that they actually are from the Middle Eastern part of the world, mm-hmm. uh, a little bit of stretching into the Western Africa and then into the Middle Eastern Asia. So part of this does actually has pretty good representation and stuff like that, mm-hmm. which Disney has always striven for, at least in the past 20 years, in terms of just trying to reach as many global audiences as, as possible. But... It didn't help. <laughs> Unfortunately, what this movie should have been, this should have been either like District B-13 or Crank or The Matrix. You know, something like a <laughs> hyper, maybe not violent, but hy- hyper action film where basically it's, you got, run, if this movie would have been directed by the guy who did Run, Rolo, or Lola Run kind of situation. Mm. Where basically you got to get from point A, point B, fast as possible, go kind of thing. That could have been something, because that's basically what the game is. Yeah, the entire movie, like, I think one reason why it felt so cheesy is there was a lot of, like, parkour and climbing and jumping and um, references to be, like, you remember when you 
climbed this thing in the game? Well, he's climbing a thing in real life now. Remember when the bricks were falling and he started jumping up the bricks? Whoa. Yeah. Now Parkour. He... <laughs> uh, so it was just that kind of like... That thing that video game movies always fuck up when they do is trying to put that little nod to the game in. It's Don't. Don't do that. <laughs> just try to make it good. You don't... Like, the people seeing the movie know that it's based off the game already. <laughs> so... Have visual... Okay. Have visual references. Do not have thematic references. Yeah. I don't give a shit Nolan North is sitting on a goddamn lawn or beach chair and talking about, oh yeah, that happened to me once. Bullshit. Cut that out of your fucking movie. <laughs> oh, also, spoilers. Here's spoiler for Uncharted. Oh boy, yeah, I need to add that to our list. No, no it's a fun movie. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, it can't be worse than Assassin's Creed. Oh god, we, which... were, we gotta do that next, don't we? Probably, unless we can get uh, the cool cat in here to do talk about something interesting, which he's are... finally gonna make me watch um, Legend of Chun Li, isn't he? <laughs> no, maybe uh, Tekken or Dead or, Dead or Alive. That's better. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> <sighs> <No>. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so this movie, like I said, it had an almost good plot. Um, we could still summarize it pretty quickly, and you can just imagine a lot of um, action with slow motion bits and uh, parkour along the way. Uh, basically, what, uh, the kid on the street gets in a fight with some soldiers to save his little buddy, and uh, as they catch him and are about to kill him, the king decides to adopt him. So, um, cut two years later, the adopted kid and the, the blood-related kid, they're, like, talking about army plans. They end up invading and attacking a neighboring city because they're smuggling weapons or something. I don't know. Was that a reference to the invasion of Iraq? They did mention Iraq at one point, but... Yeah, probably. We uh, believe that uh, Iraq may be holding weapons of mass destruction. Well, it wasn't weapons of mass destruction. It was smuggling. But yeah, in anyway, uh, <laughs> it doesn't really even matter. Well, I guess it kind of does. It does matter to the plot. Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Actually, they may not be smuggling it, but they are holding potentially a world-ending WMD in the film. So, symbolism? <laughs> They have the key to destabilizing the entire region, and now it's up to our heroic prince to unify and... Well, we okay, had... I'm putting way, way too much thought into that. We <laughs> hadn't even got that far yet, so... <laughs> uh, they, yeah, they capture the city. The princess dis uh, agrees to marry one of the brothers in order to, like, keep her citizens safe or whatever. They find this... or. or Jake Gyllenhaal's character finds this crazy-looking dagger that Just is... Dustin, who the entire film, I'm going, are they <laughs> literally calling this pasty motherfucker Dustin? <laughs> yeah, so he finds this magic dagger that he doesn't know is magic. Uh, someone, like, poisons a cloak that he gives his father. Father dies. Everyone thinks he did it. So him and the, the princess escape, and they figure out or he figures out that the knife is magic and it can turn back time. It literally has a goddamn unsafe or a fucking load game button on the back of it. <laughs> yeah, so they go on this journey to prove that uh, Dastan, or Jake Gyllenhaal's character, did not kill his father and that it was his brother. Um, but then later they find out it wasn't even his brother, it was the, his uncle. Uh, and his brother's being manipulated the whole time. So now, they're after the uncle. Uh, and a lot of action and stuff later, you find out that the uncle's goal is to get the magic knife to break the the glass, like the hourglass of time or whatever, and spill all the sand out and release God's wrath and So that whatever. way he can go back in time, because at one point, uh, the uncle and the father king at one point 
the uncle saved his brother from being eaten by a lion, and his father always told this story of just saying, and that just goes to show that my brother loved me so much that he was able to nearly sacrifice himself to make sure that I would be instilled and become your ruly king kind of thing. Yeah, and so... And the brother has harbored, apparently, a sense of resentment for his kingly brother and has decided, you know what, if I destroy this, I can go back in time... I mm-hmm. can find myself in this situation, and then I won't let my brother survive getting attacked by the lion. Right, and uh, when you find this out, you're almost done with the movie. So this has been, like, the most of the movie just over the course of, like, an hour and a half, um, just because there's that much parkour. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, uh, him and the and the princess end up falling in love, which is... Not totally something you saw coming since they were so angry with each other at the beginning of the movie. Wow, isn't writing movies hard? Extremely. <laughs> One of the things that I remember hearing about this film is that they originally did it so that way it felt almost like a uh, Hepburn and Bogart style mm. like African Queen kind of adventure where it's like, you know, you start out just hating each other and bickering and stuff like that. And I want to say that that is a pretty hacky way of doing it. And I can definitely say it's a hacky way of doing it, but it's also an effective way of doing it because anybody who has known anything about, well, pretty much cinema for the past 50, 70, nearly 100 goddamn years now, um, you've got Romance in the Stone, mostly Indiana Jones films, Pirates of the Caribbean in that regard, um, soon to be The Lost City of... And eh, whatever the fuck it's called, the Lost City, <laughs> City of V, City of Z, whatever. I haven't heard of that one. Oh, it's the new one where it's basically a modern remake of *Romancing the Stone* with mm. Channing Tatum and Sandra Bullock. Yay! <laughs> Yay! No. Well, it's got Daniel Radcliffe as a villain, and oh well, yeah, he's pretty right. good. I like that. <laughs> well, I think he's playing Weird Al in the new biopic that just. Oh my gosh! They just finished shooting it. I'm so happy. Yeah, I can't wait to see that one. And apparently, it's by the same people who produced and wrote the. Um, Weird Al biopics trailer a few years back on uh, Funny or Die, which is just genius. So because it's that same production company, I'm really hoping that Pat Oswalt is playing Dr. Demento, because it's like, that is the greatest casting I've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, that'd be ever. sweet. Um, anyway, slight digression. Yeah, no, I want to get mad at this film for using this hackneyed, trite, just overtired usage of it Will they, won't they, she hates him, he hates her, in the end they get together kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I know for a fact Disney's never going to stop that, considering how much fucking Jungle Cruise made last year. Oh, yeah. 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 So if we do do a Pitfall episode, are we going to talk about Jungle Cruise instead, or are we just going to go straight to the other things? Oh, man. Uh, Well, I've... (laughs) I don't know, man. (laughs) I don't want to prepare myself for disappointment. Uh, (laughs) but yeah anyway so they um i don't know they figure out his plan they figure out who you know what everything's going on they go to stop him and he ends up getting the dagger and he's gonna go use it to break the thing uh on the way he kills um jake gyllenhaal's brother who is now acting as king oh they also kill his other brother Played by Toby Kebbell. Oh, who yeah. We saw last week, twice, when we did our episode on Warcraft. So, actually, the two highest grossing video game movies of all time, Warcraft and this film, both star Toby Kebbell. <laughs> and he dies in both of them. Yep. Uh, they end up, like, going to this temple to try and stop him, and the, the princess dies. Um, but Jake Gyllenhaal and the uncle fight over the knife as it's in this glass thing and the sands of time are going everywhere. They get thrust back in time to right after when uh, they were raiding the city unfairly and Jake Gyllenhaal stops his uncle in front of everyone and gets in a fight. And uh, So yeah, in the end, everything is fine and he ends up marrying the princess and saving his brother and the world or whatever. Um... Ta da! <laughs> it was. Also, a little along the way, they made friends with Prof- or Dr. Octopus, who uh, is a pretty much an owner of a racetrack of ostriches. 
and they get on his bad side, then his good side. And so, um, yes, Alfred, the great Alfred Molina is in this. <laughs> Basically playing the, a cross between Han Solo and Jabba the Hutt in terms of his illegal intentions. And then ends up hooking up with them all while caring for ostriches for one reason or another. <laughs> yeah, it was... Uh, they did a good job with a lot of parts of this movie. Um, Casting great character actors. Mm-hmm. Yes. Just set design as well as kind of the look of the whole film very much yes but shooting on location throughout pretty much a lot of scenic areas that are anywhere from the Kun Valley of Pakistan to over to uh, different parts of um, uh, Omar and uh, oh, I a place they uh, North Africa yes hmm. so it looks the part they filmed on location in most of the part for the exteriors But like you said, when you have the guy who wrote the original game, who originally, well, basically had his game made for him by input from other people he worked with, <laughs> you can't write a movie by fucking post-it note, man. <laughs> I mean, as we learned from yeah. the shit my dad says, you can't use goddamn post-it notes to drive an entire narrative structure. And he did, I think, the structure he got right... Things resolved. Things usually made sense. It's just the way things happened were a little too cheesy, overdone, and campy. Now, if they actually would have campified this film, how, how great would that have been? Had they actually done almost like a like a um, just like a totally self-aware like a like a like that version like an original Sinbad film. Or like a Jason and the Argonauts, like something of that era, like a Sword and Sandals. Ah, um, oh crap! I just forgot that guy's name. The, uh, all the special effects guys are just screaming at me right now. <laughs> the one special effects guy screaming at me right now. That listens to us. Um, God, what is his name? Uh, the guy who did like Clash of the Titans, the original Clash of the Titans, uh, Beast from Fifty Thousand Fathoms. Um, uh, it was the student of Willis O'Brien, the guy who did King Kong. Come on, why can't I? Uh, Ray Harryhausen. Like a Ray Harryhausen-esque like, monster is going around in this mm. and fighting. Like skeleton, like, you know. Like the original game, had you had Jake Gyllenhaal fighting skeletons, that would have been amazing. Yeah, if they would have made it a little more, uh, like, otherworldly, uh, it would have been... Oh, I don't know, like the game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, this literally felt like if you turned a combination of Aladdin, um, The Lion King, and Game of Thrones into one film is what this felt like. Yeah. And then you tell him, okay, here's the here's the time extending MacGuffin. Go kill him, pretty much. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess with that, Elmer, was this movie a bop or a flop for you? I saw this movie once before sober, and I forgot it within a week. <laughs> Rewatching this movie twelve years later, I can honestly say I have not been this disinterested in watching a movie since the fucking Eternals. This is this has <laughs> been the hardest flop we've watched so far. <laughs> you really? Yes. Worse than House of the Dead? At least I can look at the incompetence on screen and that makes sense. I watch this and I am mystified in the fact that <laughs> this is the fucking Disney Corporation. This is a well-established director, well-established production company, well-established actors, music composers, and I am this bored watching the film. <laughs> How? Yeah. Yeah, well, I... <laughs> I'm going to say it was a flop for me, but it it is definitely, to me, in, in no way close to the worst movie we've seen on this podcast. By no means. It's not the worst movie we've seen. What I mean is, though, I have not seen a movie that we've watched yet that has made me go, why would you make this? <laughs> right. It is a movie that I could watch again, given enough time, and not ha- completely hate myself for it. But yeah, like I said, it's just a little too like predictable, overdone, um, like tropey. I, I just it it just felt like 
they just like kind of took someone's formula and just we'll make it Prince of Persia now. Yeah, it's called The Mummy. Direct that came out in nineteen ninety nine, starring Rachel Wise. So yeah. much so that they cast who looks to be basically the clone of uh, Rachel Wise, or sorry, Rachel Weiss, uh, the fantastic Gemma Arterton. Who, yeah, no, she looks like a. No joke, they have to make a movie where Gemma Arterton and Rachel Wise play sisters or something like that, right? <laughs> I mean, those two, you put them next to each other, it's just like, oh yeah, that's like her older sister, her kid sister kind of situation, right? I don't know who Gemma Arterton... That was the princess in this movie. Or who the other one? Rachel Weiss? Rachel Weiss, yeah. The gal in The Mummy? I can't picture her. It's been... I haven't seen The Mummy since oh. I was a kid. I remember loving it, but I can't picture her. Ah, and my mind just went blank. I, other than Enemy at the Gates and people are probably... Two people are probably yelling at their uh, <laughs> at their radios <laughs> or their headphones right now. Hey, I can't remember the best movie. No, my, my mind just went blank on other movies Rachel Weisz has been in, but no, she's fantastic. <laughs> well, all right, yeah. So, flop for both of us, but it 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 could be worse. It could have been a bop. It could have been. It really um, could have. I mean, no, I mean, well, I was thinking about that earlier today on what they could have done to make this movie really awesome. And I think I solved it. I really do think I solved it. Mm-hmm. Because this movie came af- came out well after the other the other two games in the series came out, which uh, <laughs> the first game, or I should say, of the relaunch of the 3D version of this, Prince Persia, Persia Sense of Time, uh, was a T-rated game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the two that they came after that, they tried to go off of it. I did a little bit of digging myself, I guess I should say. And I kind of remember playing these other two games a little bit more than the Sands of Time. Mm-hmm. Uh, they went a little bit more of a God of War route in terms of a lot more violence that they mm-hmm. had and a lot more blood and whatnot. What they should have done is they should have went in that direction. Can you imagine had like the Crank guys been in charge of doing the Prince of Persia? But fighting like the Wishmaster from the Wishmaster series? Yeah, if they honestly, if the action would have been better um i would have probably liked it more but it was just too i don't know it'd be like he's walking away from a fire and he's got his long greasy hair and he takes both swords out from behind his back and it's slow motion and like fuck off with that (laughs) Uh, this looked lame when conan the barbarian did it (laughs) <laughs> the only person badass enough to do that was Ronnie James Dio, and he's only five foot six. <laughs> five foot five. Um, but yeah, so with that, I'm uh, ready to get this ended. We've been live for about an hour now, so. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you want to figure out where to listen to us, um, you can go to gamelink.click. Um, you can catch us pretty much every week on Sundays. Um, at twitch.tv slash levy. That's where we're live streaming now. Um, otherwise, yeah, you can find our Patreons and YouTubes and whatever else we're doing um, at gamelink.click. So um, happy Sunday, everyone. Well, I hope you all have a great week. We will see you next time. And if it's not Tekken or DOA next time, uh, do we have a backup plan? What did we mention before? What was it? Uh, either Assassin's Creed or Doom, maybe? Oh, Assassin's Creed or Doom. One of the two. We'll come up with something good. Yeah, but... it spells Doom for one of our asses. <laughs> sure. so, anyway. All right. Have a good, good night, everyone. And I right, folks, stay safe, stay sexy.